Case is dropped on Soccer's Morning Show Thursday Thoughts here at Soccer Down Here. Very, very busy show this morning. We're going to be going in a lot of different directions. I know that surprises you. Uh, here's the rundown. Uh, got a couple of guests this morning. The USLW season is starting this weekend here in this part of the country. Uh, 945, we will catch up with the uh, head coach and technical director of the Greenville Liberty. We're going to get Julie Carlson to hop on and Talk about last season and getting ready for this season. And at 1030, defending champs in USLW, Tormenta, Jim Robbins, their head coach, he's going to join us at 1030. So we're going to be drifting into uh, USLW coverage a little bit this morning. Uh, Okay, bam, AFC Asian Cups were uh, drawn earlier this morning. We'll keep an eye on that. Morning, Coco. Morning, everybody. There's uh, a lot of news to get into. Uh, especially in Major League Soccer. We had Open Cup last night. We had two goals in three minutes by a couple of Premier League vets to give uh, the uh, blue team in the uh, uh, Derby uh, Madonina. I know there's a middle word in there. I forgot it. But the uh, the Derby last night or yesterday afternoon, 2-0 win. Ed and Jekko and Henrik Mctarian. So uh, they scored within two minutes and uh, three minutes, and that was a 2-0 win in the first leg of that semifinal. So we got news uh, all over the place. We've got Europa, Europa Conference League. Uh, later today, you've got David Moyes trying to possibly save his job. He, pro- he says that if he was to win uh, Europa Conference League, it would be his greatest career achievement while staving off relegation at the same time. So we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, Bam as a public service is put, posting the groups for uh, Asian Cup uh, in the Twitch pitch. And there's stuff going on all over the place. And so we welcome in Jarrett Smith to hang out on a very, very busy Thursday. Jarrett joining us in hour one, and the real world doesn't intervene. Good morning. No, it does that in the second hour. We just ah. flip things up. It's ah. okay. Okay. Real world's still going to intervene. Real world might intervene for an Irish goodbye at some point. At some point. But for now, we just we run with what we got. Yeah, uh, open cup last night. And, We're stupid. Yeah, so uh, one so, cup set. I wanted more, damn it. But I know. Also, some of this, some of this hinges on the fact that uh, they scared Paul uh-huh. because we had USL on USL crime, and instead of like lining up your USL teams to take down MLS, you're having USL teams take each other down because y'all scared. Yes. So you've got. Uh, so and, and I kind of looked at it uh, since uh, this has uh, completely evolved into the the opening kickoff brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee, kickoffcoffeeco.com. And uh, don't forget to uh, use the code soccer down here 15 when you invest in Kickoff Coffee and you get the best of Kickoff Coffee and then they in turn take 10% reinvested into the youth game and youth initiatives very cool stuff from our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. You know Jared, I kind of look at the Open Cup at least two nights of it where it's like the uh, the March and April college basketball tournament, where there's always that one day where you always have like the 12s, the 13s, the 14s, and the 15s, and maybe even a 16 taking out some of the bigger seeds. There's always that one day of chaos, and then the next day is kind of quiet by comparison. And last night, you know, we talked about the uh, the cup set yesterday, where Bob Lilly, who might be yelling at his team even though he won. Uh, Loudon gets a red card within the first 10 minutes. They're playing a man down. Crew put five on the board in the first 45, and it was over. Uh, your boy Christian Ramirez, C-Ram, got the fifth goal on the board. Uh, FC Cincinnati waited a while, got the one goal they needed. They beat NYCFC. You mentioned USL on USL crime. Legion and Memphis 901 at Protective. What were some of your takeaways there? Just a weird game, man. Um, and we, we could talk to Kaylor about it when when he joins at the end of the month. Um, I might bug Kaylor before then too, um, <laughs> because like Legion haven't been good. <clears throat> they haven't. Um, and Legion when they have to play behind haven't been good. 
uh, Memphis hit the post early in that game in like the sixth or seventh minute. Uh, Memphis hits the post and it kicks out. And then Birmingham goes and gets a goal off corner kick from Juan Agudelo. And then Memphis starts chasing. And uh, yeah, Kaler uh, actually posted a really cool thing about this. If you want to check it out on, on Twitter's uh, basically like a tactical breakdown. Cause yeah, like Birmingham is really damn good on the flanks. Yeah. Like really damn good. Enzo Martinez is 108 years old and he still will fight you. Yes. Um, but Memphis is really damn good in the middle. Uh, Birmingham brought guys inside. Um, you know, and John, USL Tactics also uh, yes. touched on it some this morning, like the, the way they brought guys inside and uh, and were able to help control that middle. And you got some really good performances from guys like Lopez and Asiedu, who Birmingham needed good performances from, and they got them. Memphis started chasing the game, and Birmingham executed it beautifully. They kept Memphis from creating too many super dangerous chances, and then they hit on counters. It was really well done by, by a Birmingham team that desperately needed a good result. Um, and Memphis, that's the first game they have lost, I think, in seven. Yeah. Um, overall, of all competitions. Like, they, right. uh, they've been, they, have, they had been cruising. So now they'll get back to league play, and they've got to bounce back, but – yeah, Birmingham executed that really well. They 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 dodged the early bullet because I think it's a different game if Birmingham goes down and Birmingham has to chase, no uh, and they and they kind of get exposed. But and then the third goal, it's it's three it's three nil. The third goal, I don't really give a damn about personally because the third goal at that point you are it's like the 85th minute. You're chasing, you're desperate, and you give up a goal on the counter because you got guys forward. It's the same thing we talked about with Atlanta giving up that third goal in Nashville. Um, you can't equate the third goal when you're protecting a lead or giving up a late goal when you're protecting a lead to giving up a late goal when you are chasing a game. There are two different game state situations and you're treating them differently. If you give up a goal when you're protecting a lead, it really sucks because you are failing at your very particular job. If you give up a goal while you are chasing and everybody's forward and you give up like a three on two, stuff happens. Yes. So it was really well worked by really well worked by Birmingham. And uh, now, depending on what happens with the fight in Bob Lilly's uh, Birmingham and I think Birmingham and uh, Pittsburgh are the last two standing uh, non MLS teams. And you've got the other action that happened uh, last night in Open Cup. You had Jason. Nash- I don't know, man. Like if Atlanta would have lost would have lost the Legion. I don't know. Like it's. The Legion were hard to pin down, man, because like they've been really not great. No, they have not to start the season, which I know Kaylor's joked about before. Is that Legion are a team that start the year awful? They look like the best team in the league in the middle of the season, and then as the year's winding down, they go back to being weird and bad. They've been like, yeah. See, Jarrett starts talking poorly about uh, Birmingham Legion. Really housed over the weekend. Yeah. Um, so I was not expecting them to put on that kind of performance. No. Uh, right now in the East, uh, Legion, they have lost two in a row. They're 5-4-1. and one. They're second right now in the Eastern Conference, two points behind the Charleston Battery. Birmingham have actually played 10 matches already this season. So just, yeah, the last few, the, like they started out, they actually started out okay. And then, man, they just, last few games have just been weird. Yeah, I mean, they lose been bad. 4-1 to Oakland. 3-1 to the Miami FC, and then, yeah, then you beat uh, Tampa, and you don't know which one you're going to get. I mean, Phoenix beats you, uh, Phoenix beats you 2-1, and then you just give up a, a the metric crap ton of goals, and you're just kind of like, okay, this is interesting. So you, you don't know literally which team you're going to be getting when it comes to Birmingham. The one that gets blown out by uh, Miami and Oakland or the one that beats Tampa. So it's just like, okay, uh, literally, you do not know which Birmingham team you're going to be getting so far this season. Uh, other matches, uh, seems like shutouts were the way of the, the middle games. Nashville shuts out uh, FC Dallas 2-0 at Geotis. Houston shuts out Sporting 1-0. Austin FC in an Alex Tembakis sighting 
shuts out New Mexico United by the score. Nashville beating a team two nothing is kind of like <laughs> it, it's kind of like when Iowa wins a football game by scoring fifteen points. It is Kirk Ferentz's distilled perfection. Ugh, yikes! Uh, Galaxy showed up. And it'll be an interesting conversation that we have later today with Nico Moreno. Uh, Thursdays with Nico's at 2.30 on the network. Uh, Galaxy beating Seattle 3-1, and then Portland losing at home to RSL 4-3. So uh, you have all of the uh, the MLS teams uh, that, uh, let's see, so Crew, Cincinnati, uh, Legion code through from USL Championship, Nashville, Houston, Austin, Galaxy, and uh, RSL. Then you have uh, Inner Miami, Charlotte, Red Bulls, River Hounds, Fire, Minnesota United, Colorado Rapids, and LAFC who can't get out of their own way. So there are two USL championship teams that are left, Birmingham and Pittsburgh, as LAFC uh, still has multiple competitions that they have to be concerned about. So uh, yeah, it's like you send you send a bunch of uh, U17s up and you still end up winning in a shootout. So that didn't quite happen the way that I'm sure they anticipated. So that's your that's your rundown. And uh, Galaxy to host LAFC in the next round. <laughs> Bam is calling for cold envelopes. So Bam, Bam yeah. is Bam is going David Stern on us here. He's thinking that uh, that there were cold envelopes. So Galaxy hosting LAFC. Uh, that will be uh, very, very interesting. Uh, and uh, Jason Nix, I was not aware of this. And so of course, Nix says that a ton and a metric ton are not the same. Well, yeah, I mean, it would make sense. Metric ton with metric measurements and ton with the uh, the other. What's what's uh, what's the opposite of metric? I mean, American, I guess. So uh, imperial so you, is the term you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. That's what we're staring at. Um, and. Uh, so that's where we are. Uh, oh, okay. So this, this is like Thursday thoughts. And so Bam, Bam is right in, uh, yeah. <laughs> Bam is like, you have metric and wrong. Uh, Bam with an interesting note out of Belarus. Yeah. We're in accurate yeah. because one of them is based on 10 and is pretty damn logical. Yes. And the other one is the one we use that is just kind of like, how do you, how do you, uh, how, how do you make one enter into another with inches and feet and centimeters versus meters? Oh, that's always based on 10. Okay. Uh-huh. Well, how many, how many inches in a foot? 12. How many feet in a yard? Three. Why? Because F you, that's why yes. nothing about our system makes sense. Correct. So yes, 2000 and 2200. Yes. Nick. Uh, so in the spirit of Thursday thoughts, bam, in addition to giving the, the Asian cup uh, uh, group stage uh, out of Belarus, the champions, Shakhtar Sologorsk, have been deducted 30 points and 20 for next season and stripped of their title in 22 due to match fixing. Fellow Belarusian Premier League clubs, Energetic BGU and Belshina Bobruisk, have been sanctioned as well. So here's a 50-point sanction for you. That's the biggest sanction I think I've ever seen. A 50-point deduction for match fixing. Speaking of match fixing, allegedly. Do you know how to avoid that? Don't, don't fix matches. Don't fix matches, exactly. Uh, speaking of interesting things out of Major League Soccer, uh, Tommy Scoops, the Colorado Rapids yesterday afternoon, or last night, uh, removed midfielder Max from all team activities as Major League Soccer investigates his connection with an unlawful with unlawful sports gambling. He is alleged to have received about 12000 bucks to purposely get a yellow card last season against LA Galaxy. And the uh, yellow card in question, he was in for about a minute and a half, got a yellow card for a high boot on Chicharito. And, uh, you know, uh, Tom says that the foul is pretty innocuous, but, uh, you know, when uh, you have a player take their boot and, like, launch it towards somebody's face, then, uh, I mean, I don't think he made contact with Chicharito's face. I think the ball did. But uh, the play in question is uh, Max getting about a, a yellow minute and a half in, and it is alleged that he has benefited $12,000 for that yellow card. And he has been since removed from all team activities as Major League Soccer investigates. You know, when we say that 
a foul is getting your money's worth. We didn't mean literally, but apparently it's literal now. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, it is literal. Uh, so that's uh, uh, that's what you're at. Uh, Coco, can Syria take a look at that kind of punishment for Juve, the 50-pointer? No. Uh, <clears throat> no, uh, because Syria is – that field is playing tilted, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ricky Ricardo this morning on uh, Golasso Network's Morning Footy made a point regarding issues. Where was this energy from the league when racism was in play? That's a question for the league, and it is somewhat an open-ended question as well. Uh, a question you won't get an answer from from the is, league. That is correct. And, and also, uh, other stuff going on. Uh, yesterday, we talked about what happened in the CanChamp match with Toronto and CF Montreal Impact, probably, hopefully, maybe sooner rather than later. Probably Never. Where hashtag thrown megaphone was a, a part of the discussion. And, uh, you know, you, you get mad at uh, you, you get mad at somebody and you're just kind of yelling at them. And, and from the capo stand, you're yelling at them. And uh, as it turns out, you end up you're so mad that you throw the megaphone at the player that you're mad at. Mark Anthony K. And because of that, it was decided by CF Montreal, in addition to the fighting that we saw in the stands, uh, where CF Montreal folks uh, basically warned Toronto, hey, we're coming, we need extra security, and apparently there wasn't because there was some, there was some fighting going on in the stands. CF Montreal made a, a statement yesterday, a couple of sentences. Incidents occurred on Tuesday night in Toronto, unfortunate and unacceptable. CF Montreal condemns all acts of violence and an investigation is underway. Safety of our fans and supporters groups is of paramount importance. No violence of any kind is tolerated at Stade Saputo nor any other stadium to which our fans travel. So CF Montreal, because these two teams are playing again this weekend at Stade Saputo, CF Montreal made the decision to close the visiting supporters section For the Saturday match against Toronto, TFC fans who purchase tickets will get refunded. They're in discussion with Canada Soccer, MLS, and Toronto FC to ensure that all future events take place in a safe and secure environment. So CF Montreal basically shut the door. After seeing what happened at BMO, they're like, nope, not happening. Nobody's coming. And, uh, you know, you want a refund, you get a refund. So Toronto then responded. They say they're actively investigating the incidents that occurred at BMO uh, against CF Montreal. Toronto FC and MLSE have a zero tolerance policy for violence. We continue to prioritize the safety of our fans, players and staff committed to ensuring BMO field is a safe and welcoming environment for all further details and actions will be available once the investigations are complete. So uh, CF Montreal, it's going to get it's going to be it's going to look weird. But. Uh, yeah. So CF Montreal, after seeing the video of fans getting beaten up in Toronto is like, nope, not happening. So it's, it's, you're going to see this big gap where tickets, you know, normally would have folks standing or sitting, not happening this weekend. CF Montreal shut the door on that quickly. And so now we have the investigation going on and we'll see what happens at the end of it. But, you know, I made the point yesterday, Jarrett, that dude who threw the megaphone has no business being anywhere near a soccer match ever again. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 frustration and I get frustration. But, yeah, you can't you can't start throwing things at guys like it's you can't function like this. No, you can't act like this. You got you cannot act like children. No. And that's what people decided to do. So, you know, so what you're t- left with, what you're left out. with at that point is you're in time. Whatever, out. Yeah, you want to act like a child? Fine, you're you're a child now. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. So, uh, th- like I said, it will be an interesting it will be an interesting dynamic uh, this weekend at Stad Saputo. Yeah, absolutely. Alex is square. Good morning, Alex. Hope you're doing well. Alex, right on. It's not frustration. It's assault. Absolutely correct. And the uh, the numpty, and I'll go ahead and use that word, the numpty that threw the megaphone, I'm hoping 
that his, I mean, and this is from the Capo stand in the end zone, one of the Capo stands, dude's yelling at Mark Anthony K because you lose in the can champ. You lose. So as a result, you feel compelled to take a megaphone. And, and I priced it out yesterday. It could be anywhere from 52 to $222, depending on hmm. how, what kind of a megaphone you get. Thank so you. you decided that you were going to be so mad at Mark Anthony K. Yeah, Abby should have been arrested. Absolutely. And, and I want to know what the OPP is going to be doing uh, attached to all of this. Guy should have been arrested. You thought that because you bought a ticket, you could yell whatever you want and however you wanted to a player, and then you decide for whomever invested however many dollars on that megaphone that you were so mad that you threw the megaphone at Mark Anthony K. I'm hoping the rest of the supporters in that supporter section you know, narc on you. They call you out. They give your name to Toronto FC and the Ontario Provincial Police, and you're done. I yeah, hope they paddle tail on him so quickly it's not even funny. We see we run into this in all sports though, where like, where it's this mindset people have that I'm 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 a real fan because I'm holding them to this standard. I'm you know I'm a real fan and I'm going to show up by doing this. Like, no, you're not. I mean, yeah, you might be a fan. Mm-hmm. You're being a petulant child, yes. and you're trying to mask your petulant childness under a, under a shield of "I'm a real fan," but it's not. Being a little brat about it, yes, you're. That's you're, the that's the end of the line on it. Like you're making other people look bad. Um, and I know, like, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, he like he wasn't really close to hitting him. It wasn't this, that, or the other. Like, that's not the point. Mm-hmm. Because the point is, if you throw it, you're opening up a floodgate potentially where more people start doing stuff, and then someone does get hit down the road. So you do have to nip it early. Yeah. So any because any time this sort of thing happens, I feel like we get this this downplay of it where it's oh well he didn't hit him, it wasn't that big of a deal. You're overreacting. All it takes is somebody to actually get hit and then you start tracing it back to that original incident and when you make excuses for it you open the potential for weird stuff to happen you might call it overreacting call it whatever you want Mm -hmm. but don't just don't do it no that no uh alex says that we're giving the person too much credit he didn't decide anything he reacted like a child this is what antisocial behavior looks like no calculation just reaction and in, the, and in the Twitch pitch, I have uh, found, Bam says that uh, you call somebody a flog, uh, the worst that you can be called in Australia. So uh, I went ahead and found the, the definition of flog in Australia through a Merriam-Webster and posted it in the Twitch pitch. So folks can get the, the word of the month from December of 2018, flog, and they now have a new word to use when it comes to, yeah, I mean, well, Rick, I, well, I mean, it, <laughs> Let's be careful about using other countries' words well, no. without knowing the full intent of them. Well, because the, that feels like a genuinely terrible idea. Well, the it, the the Oxford. This is from an Oxford dictionary. Oxford says noun derogatory: a pretentious or conceited person, a fool. So that yeah, that's how. Just, but like we we've had this conversation, you know, with Amata Flow before about you know every country in Latin America, like different words have different have different meanings. They have different you know, different values. Like you call somebody something in one country yes, and it might be a casual, like, Oh, well, I mean, you, you call each other that between friends kind of thing <laughs> where you call somebody, you know, the same word in another country. Yes. And next thing you know, you got, you're, you're like wondering how do I quickly remove, how do I safely remove this blade from my side while minimizing the blood loss? Yes, and Coco says using other countries' insults feels like a great way to end up on a disciplinary report. It's a really good way to end up on a disciplinary report, and it's a really good way to like pick your teeth off the ground. That is absolutely true. Uh, that's uh, that's definitely true. Uh, Julie, so, Carlson, yeah, have fun with things. Just be careful. Yes, uh, Julie Carlson, head coach and technical director of the Greenville Liberty, coming up in fifteen minutes here on a, a very very busy, very very busy show today. 
Uh, we do be like that sometimes. Yeah, yeah, we do be like that. Um, apparently, everyone, according to uh, Doug Robertson of the AJC, uh, Doug is at practice this morning. And apparently everyone, and I do mean everyone, is uh, is practicing. And that included uh, someone with the last name of Gazan. Uh, he says uh, every Atlanta United player is training. First time in uh, three or four seasons, he thinks. Gazan was supposed to be out at least 10 weeks. After four and a half, he is training with Atlanta United. So uh, so you, you got that. And uh, very, very, uh, very, very cool news that Brad is training. Obviously, you don't know to what extent, mind you, that he is training. But nevertheless, that Brad is training after four and a half. Yeah, four and a half. He's supposed to be out 10. And after four and a half weeks, Coco, he is training. So that is uh, that is what we classify as very, very cool and very, very good news. And uh, also have uh, a couple of uh, changes in the Atlanta United schedule. Uh, the match against the Revs on Wednesday will now kick off at 7 o'clock. Match was originally scheduled to kick off at 7.30. So prepare uh, in 20 days' time. Uh, be, please be prepared to do everything a half hour earlier. So kick off at 7.09 on uh, season pass and FS1 as opposed to 739. And then obviously what we kind of figured the road match against LAFC on June 3rd is, is going to be moved because LAFC is kind of busy with uh, champions. Yeah, League. And so that's going to be played on either Wednesday, June the 7th or Wednesday, September 13th. It's contingent upon LAFC reaching the quarters of the open cup. If uh, LAFC wins their round of 16 match, then the match gets rescheduled for September. LAFC's round of 16 opponent determined by the draw held later today with the game scheduled to be played May 23rd or 24th. If they lose that match, then the match gets rescheduled for June 7th. So when the Revs come to town, plot everything a half hour early for the match against LAFC out there. Could be in June, could be in September. We'll keep an eye on that. So that's uh, that's that's what you're that's what you're staring at. So a uh, couple of so just adjust adjust, uh, adjust your schedules appropriately. Uh, yes, and, and happy yes. We know that Jared, when our South American players must be taught what words to not use. And uh, soccer for good, OG. OG, good to have you back in the in the stacks. Uh, OG says that you certainly have a way with words, Jared. I mean, which is just true. Like I said, you just you gotta be careful with what you say to people. Because yes, you do. yes, you for absolutely. for some for some for some people it might be you know depending on where they're from might be some casual. Yes, somebody else. But that's the might day. start an international conflict. Yes, and you don't want that. Try not to do either one of those if you can help it. Correct. Uh, OG says that Gazan also has a tremendous mentality of mind over matter, and that that also she ain't kidding with that either. I mean. Brad is just absolutely. Mm. I mean, when you when you come to guys that really really want to compete and get back to where they were, Brad is definitely one of those dudes that uh, that, that wants to get back ahead of schedule to make sure that he is a part of everything and uh, everything going forward. Uh, let's see, we've got NWSL expansion on the table. It looks like. Uh, you're going to get teams added, and it appears that you're probably going to – Jessica Berman had a press conference. She said that they're going to shoot for 16 by 2026, and it looks like Boston is going to be in the mix, but there's a slot that is open for that 16th team once uh, everybody is added into the mix, and we'll see what it looks like there. So Team 16 is now in play, and we actually – we believe it or not, Jarrett, we actually have renderings. We have renderings of Dylan Butler Estates. <laughs> the stadium that might come to pass. It also might come to pass. Oh, uh, a, a sidebar update on uh, Max and Colorado and the uh, investigation with unlawful sports gambling. Houston, former Houston Dynamo fullback Zika, also named in the same allegations, spent one season with the Dynamo before the club declined his option back in 23. He's currently playing for Brazilian second-tier side EC Vitoria, but we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, but, yeah, we actually do have renderings for Dylan Butler Estates, $780 million, 
25,000-seat soccer-specific stadium, Willits Point, Queens, plan to open ahead of the uh, 27 season. And a reminder that NYCFC played home games in five separate stadia last year. But we now have actual renderings uh, of Dylan Butler Estates. The, the Dylan Butler Stadium uh, initially shown at a, a meeting to Community Board 7, a local governmental advisory board to outline early plans for the stadium and surrounding area in Willits Point. So after uh, how many years? 38 of trying to figure out a place for a stadium. It looks like uh, within within earshot of City Field, you're going to get 2,500 units of affordable housing, 40,000 square feet of public open space, a community uh, school, hotel, ground floor retail shops, stadium, 25,000. And we've been talking about this kind of stuff in the past. It does not look like there's any room for building anything else other than 25,000 seats. Yeah, that's that's something that needs to be mentioned about this because, like, it seems to be the case. Like, you're, you're kind of limited right here with what you can do. Um, and, and some of it's you're limited because of, you know, where you are. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're 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 limited on space. It's part of when you build in a city. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you have to get creative. Mm-hmm. Happens. Yeah. So. And yeah, and unfortunate, and, but yeah, unfortunate, I mean, but it happens. Yeah, I mean, and looking at the renderings and this, and what I'll post the the link to the article from Tommy Scoops in the Twitch pitch. But you look at, uh, but I'm just happy they might be getting an actual stadium, like a stadium where people can actually play a game that's not baseball. Yeah. And it's minor victories, y'all. Yeah. And not having to replant uh, grass over the top of infield dirt. Yeah. And, and Coco, you're square on. The way that the renderings have it laid out, the, the way that they are laid out, you are building straight up. I mean, you have, if you, if you end up with a second level or a level above the two that are there with the sponsor name on the stadium, you're going to have to build literally straight up. There's one parking, and it's the shortest, the shortest part of that triangle of the space that they're in. But you're pinned in on one street by the housing. Mm-hmm. You're pinned in by the second street, but that would be the one where you could maybe have a, an expanded uh, third level, maybe. You're pinned in with the, the hotel space and all the other elements on your third street and your fourth street is across the street from, you're basically across the street from city field. So what you're doing is if you hit a home run and I mean, you really hit a home run like uh, Acuna did the other night and you apply that distance, maybe you're hitting the street in between uh, Dylan Butler States and, and city field. So you have literally no room except for that one face and you're you're stuck at twenty five thousand seats. Yeah, just like when uh, Andrew Carlton hit that free kick at uh, at Cool Ray Field that went over the left field fence. Yes. Or I'm sorry, it was a free kick, it was a penalty. Even worse, uh, <laughs> yeah. he, he, he took a penalty that went over the left field fence. Mm-hmm. Um. In his defense, he then went on to make like a a penalty to rescue a draw. Correct. Um. After that, but it doesn't change the fact that he. Uh, <laughs> he got he got he got under it. He did. And the fact that you got under it and, and you you went like up the rock face and you're you're hitting that thing out there on Highway 20. I mean, that was launched. He got under that one without any question whatsoever. Yeah, and yeah. and uh Ricky. Ricky's gonna think about Dylan Butler Estates, NYCFC Stadium, the way that I thought about Inter Miami ever becoming a team. Then it's just not going to happen. <laughs> well, I mean, if you think about it, you go back to the absolute beginning of this whole thing. NYCFC was announced as an expansion club back in 2013. Debuted yeah. in 2015. So we're talking eight years. Eight years! In Azkaban. And Sorry, it, it's curious. like, no, it's eight years before you finally get the announcement and the renderings, and it will be 12 years, correct, Nicks, 12 years, maybe, as Nick says, after they've started playing so they can get their alleged stadium. 
Yeah. Uh huh. Twelve years. Twelve years. It has not been fast. No. No one's ever accused it of being fast. No. And so Ricky is like, I'll believe it when I see it. And and Alex with the point. Two premier markets, L.A. and NYC, both with stadium capacities well under thirty thousand. Mm-hmm. And I mean, unless you go, unless you play at Rose Bowl or whatever. And all right, so let me let me look up now that we have now that we have the uh, now that we have Dylan Butler Estates on the board at least in in renderings. All right, so let me get the capacity for uh, BMO Stadium here. Um, all right, so capacity for BMO Stadium is listed at 22. I don't see any room for expansion. I really don't. And so BMO is stuck at 22. Uh, now let me go to the other one in Carson. I know this is making for tremendous radio. Uh, 27,000. Podcasting a visual medium, but sure. Yes. Uh, Radio even more so. 27,000 at Dignity Health Sports Park in Carson. 22 for BMO for LAFC. And you are looking at 25 for NYCFC. And Red Bulls, I don't even count them because they play in Harrison, New Jersey at this point. I mean, it's, it's, they're New Jersey and they're not even a part of the discussion and they would have problems getting 27,000 in for uh, any kind of a, a match uh, of that kind of space. So, all right, Red Bull Arena, fine. Oh, Red Bull Arena, Harrison, New Jersey. Capacity there that is never happening unless it's an international match. Um, yeah, so what, 25,000. Okay, so Red Bull Arena is 25. Dylan Butler Estates is 25, 22 for LAFC, 27 for LA Galaxy. And it's it it concern and 20 was 20,000 and change for Q2. I think you're in the low 20s for City Park in St. Louis. Sorry, City Park in St. Louis. So it concerns me that we have these stadium capacities that should be larger, but they're not. I feel like you're stunting your own growth just so you can have something shiny. That's just me. Uh, You need 30. I I really think you do. I would like to see 30. Ultimately, um, I think ultimately it'll be fine. We're just, we're looking at it in the sense of, I mean, it could be, it could be better. It could be bigger. Go big, go big. But again, some of it, some of it also dictated by the, by where you actually are. Yeah. And so you can only do in some places, you can only do so much. Yeah. Sucks. Yeah, it does. And you're trying to find space. And then uh, Coco says 30,000 is a great goal, but you, but Coco genuinely thinks that NYC can't, can't, uh, can't build that many. And, you know, you, you end up charging more for 25000 for four card. Yeah, MLS teams are thinking small. Uh, I mean, and, and to Bam's point, Bam being our resident LAFCer, glad that the stadium is the size that it is. LA fans can be fickle, and when LAFC has multiple losing seasons, it will drop off, and you won't have 22000 in the building. I mean, I get that. I mean, so would you, would you rather have a uh, – would, would you rather have a building that is small to where you can have 100% capacity or would you rather build it a little larger than you might need, hope that the novelty will bring folks in the door and then understand that if you have a dip in form that you will have a dip in attendance, but you'll still look pretty good for for something like that. That's the the big question. So. Uh, that's where we are. Uh, Jared, are you staying? Because we have a guest. Uh, I can stay for a little bit, but yeah, we can, we can, let's, let's take this to the top of the hour. Okay. All right. So, uh, what we're doing because USLW, they're starting their season. Uh, some folks I think started last weekend, but here in our footprint, we got folks who are starting this weekend. And so what we're doing today, we're catching up with a couple of teams and, uh, I was trying to filibuster right till 945, but I don't think I'm going to make it. Now, now, the beautiful thing is we're going to catch up with some coaches today. First one is up on the board, 
and we bring her into the room. Julie Carlson, the grand exalted poobah of everything on the pitch, Greenville Liberty. <laughs> Coach, thanks for hanging out with us here on SDH. Thanks for having me. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, you're good. Yep. Uh, awesome. When it comes to uh, everything going on this season, let me go back a little bit. What was the biggest lesson that you and the staff there in Greenville learned about last year that you've carried forward to this year, do you think? Uh, I think depth is really important. Um, flexibility and knowing that this season uh, with players as far as reporting back to colleges or when they can leave and when they're available, very, very much ebbs and flows. And so you have to be very adaptive and the players have to be adaptive. Um, so I think those were probably some of the biggest takeaways um, from last year. Jarrett, go for it. Your first question for Julie Carlson this morning. As far as as far as growth you've seen and, and lessons, not just from you. I mean, how much how much collaboration has been there, has been has there been between other coaches in the league to to see you know what okay what worked for us, what didn't work for us, what can we all do together to make sure this thing keeps moving forward. Yeah, I think I think what really happened was when the season ended, the USL W League um, folks reached out to all of us individually, and we all had meetings with them as far as how can we make it better, how can we be more resourceful, uh, how can we continue to grow the game and this opportunity, and and what were some of the hiccups and and obstacles that we faced, and then we would get a report back from them. Uh, and it seemed pretty similar across the board from all of us having a lot of the same um, adjustments and concerns and what we had to do to, um, to to continue moving the needle forward with the league and being successful as successful as it was last year. Um, you know, because they definitely set the standard high on how successful the league was last summer. Uh, and you can see now with the growth, you know, we've gone from 44 teams to 65 teams and we've extended out West with two new divisions. And so it's funny because it's a great question because when you start listening to all the interviews with a lot of the coaches within the league, I feel like we're all kind of saying the same things. Um, you know, you got to get creative with recruiting. You have to have good relationships uh, with colleges as far as them um, having juniors and seniors that are leaving out that may not get into the NWSL draft, but still want to play professionally and still want to play at a high level. And so I think that's really the foundation uh, as, and as well as being a new platform for our youth uh, elite players to, to be challenged. What's it like recruiting for this league because of the sprint that it is? I mean, I, I know that with the league growing as much as it is, you mentioned that the, 21 and see now you have me do math it's almost like a 50 percent growth of franchises from 44 to 65 you you have this growth of this league and now you've got all of these other folks that are chasing after the same players that that you might want for either another year or to bring into the fold there in greenville what is what's the recruiting process like now with the popularity of the league growing by leaps and bounds now yeah i think that the attraction for a lot of us probably i mean um, you know, Robbins at Tormenta can attest to this. I mean, we, a lot of us that were real successful last year, um, it kind of recruited itself uh, in that regard. And then some of the new franchises probably had to go out and recruit. A lot of it's going to be dem uh, demographically based on where players want to stay or live for the summer. Um, and then you're going to have players who reach out to different programs and try to market themselves. Uh, that's probably the biggest recruiting tool is players marketing themselves um, or clubs having relationships with their local colleges in the area to keep their players around for the summer who might have to do school or internships or work. Um, and so it's kind of a, a pocket of different directions and different pathways that you kind of go through the recruiting process. And so you start with seeing the landscape of the rosters and you're going to see a lot of the rosters are going to be filled predominantly with local players or local players from those colleges in that area. And then they're going to dabble a little bit deeper and go a little bit further out. And we actually got a question. One of our, one of our people on our Twitch pitch, who's actually out of Australia, had a question about <clears throat> uh, collaboration between y'all and the A-League. And I guess not just the A-League, but, but any other leagues around the world as, as the sport continues to grow at multiple levels. Yeah, I think we will have a platform for players that, 
you know, the A League, if they watch uh, and stream our games on Eleven Sports, you know, they can use that as a recruiting tool because of the way the seasonal calendars fall uh, between our season and the Australian League. And so it puts our players on a new platform. So we're going to have, we have players now that are already graduated college that want to continue to play somewhere. And so once they kind of get a list of those players and even reach out to the clubs or reach out to myself and say, what players will be available that you think can play and compete here it becomes now a new recruiting tool for them to bring players from the States or even international players that are playing in the States out to Australia. Australia to feed their league and and so I think that's going to be the next big connection we obviously with the USL we have uh, the Super League uh, uh, trying to launch in 2024 so the goal of that is obviously to keep players here uh, in the state create a different pro platform but I don't think that's going to take away from a player says oh I get to go live in Australia for six or seven months and play in the league um and, uh, and I know, you know, players that have played in the NWSL have taken advantage of that in their off season. So, you know, I definitely think this is going to be a new platform for, for players to, to venture in that direction. What is the wildest or most obscure contact that you have gotten about a player interested there to be a part of Greenville Liberty? I mean, have, have you gotten somebody who's like WhatsApped you from like Neptune or something? I mean, what's the, what's the wildest? <laughs> What's Probably the-, the wildest one is that I get I get wild contacts that are actually men and they fill out our inquiry and I follow up on it and find out they're a male athlete and then I send it over to the men's program. So that's probably the wildest one. Uh, you know, international players that uh, didn't do their homework uh, and find out they were actually a women's team. <laughs> so, so, so you're helping Harksy out is, is basically what's yeah, going on here. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, he helped me out. His, his daughter decided to come play for us this summer. So I'm super stoked about that. She's an awesome young lady. And, and so that obviously, um, you know, that, that relationship is important. Jarrett, what's, uh, what's next on your mind for Julie Carlson? <laughs> How big is it going in going in as, as the years start to build up here in terms of developing the culture you want to develop? Where I know it's just one year is you want to lay that foundation, but then you can you can build out a culture that just transcends players' time there and something that is appealing to not just players but to fans as well and to people in the community to be a part of. Sure, I think the game we play in the summer league has to be entertaining. Um, you know, has to be very passionate, uh, has to have a lot of energy. It, it's very short lived. You know, we play 12 games if we're not in the playoffs. And so, you know, with that, you only have six games at home and, um, you know, you have to make the most out of those six games at home for the, for the community in your area. And so it's important to bring a lot of local flavor, I think, into the program, a lot of new faces that bring a lot of personality and, and, a high technical platform that can be entertaining players to watch. I think that's important. And the culture that you build here has to be extremely positive because you want these players to come from their environments. You want them to be able to be nurtured and you want them to cultivate their game and really invest in their development. I know with the Liberty, we've been very fortunate to get a lot of the same resources our men's team has. And so it's it's almost as I've told the players a couple of days ago because uh, we now have 28 here. It basically said if you don't utilize the resources we provide for you, then you're not investing in yourself. Um, and so our job, I feel like our overall is to let players who have exhausted their eligibility have a great platform uh, to continue to play at a high level. Those college athletes to be able to come into an environment and continue to invest in themselves and develop to be prepared for their college programs and then get the youth players more educated on how to utilize resources and prepare them as they go into college. So there's a, there's a kind of a three tier player process uh, is kind of the way I look at it. And so, um, but you know, that unites a community. And I think a lot of families here in the area don't get to see their kids play that much. Um, You know, get to see them play all the time because the landscape of the college game is, is very very wide and so I think it's also an opportunity for you very young players to aspire to be these types of players uh, and also to allow families and community to see uh, ta- home talent back in their hometown. I was going to ask for those that don't know 
what soccer means to that footprint there in the upstate. How would you break down what it means and how much of a part of the fabric it is and what's it been like to see it grow under both the Liberty and the Triumph umbrella? Well, I think, you know, the landscape of the game here, uh, the investment from the local club areas, you know, you, you know, CISA primarily, um, you know, and then some small local clubs like Class and United FC. I think we've become this platform of like giving young players an opportunity to see pro level players uh, or pre-professional players on the women's side who, who will be going pro at some point, more of a close up touch and feel, you know, it's like, I, I use the, uh, ac- the analogy of like, it's like buying a pair of shoes, you know, you want to go out, you want to touch and feel them, you got to try them on, um, you know, and now this gives them this opportunity to actually go out, try it and, and see what high level soccer looks like uh, up close, because for us in the upstate, you have to travel to Charlotte, or you have to travel to Atlanta, uh, to see even the men's side. And for the women's piece, we have no women's professional sports here outside of the elite power five institutions and the college side. And so we want to try to make that landscape for our upstate fans as close as possible. And so there's been a big draw to the Liberty uh, because of that. Um, and so, and then we just have really good relationships with our community and it's important for our players to go out and, in invest in the community and so um it's like anything you get creating role models you're creating mentors um in the community and i think that's what the youth side um can um collaborate with and um bond with as far as you know building out with the players and and i guess speaking beyond the players careers i mean how how has it been in terms of also the coaching side of things or the scouting side of things where, um, where people in the community have come out and had interest in, you know, getting into coaching, getting into scouting with you and, and being able to ask questions and find their ways into that side of the game. Sure. I still think it's a little bit in the infancy stage of that. You know, we've tried to grow a coaching symposium uh, with John and his staff and myself uh, to engage the coaching community. Um, to be able to um, help them uh, grow that side of their game with the high school coaches and the local youth um, to, to teach them about, you know, strategy and, and that sort of stuff. And so I know for myself, I've been very, try to be very proactive and try to have those relationships for those that want to have, um, have a relationship. I went out and did a couple of high school training sessions for Christ church um, who I'm proud to say is still in the high school playoffs. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, she needed some, some help with finishing and, and, um, and so, you know, I gave her some activities and exercises and, and talked to her team. And, and so sometimes I think if they invest in that, it's nice to hear from another voice or another perspective. And so we help them try to get a new perspective or maybe try a different approach on things. And, um, you know, it's really about having good relationships. I think um, everything's about networking and, and people have to trust you. You're like, you're not poaching their players. You're not going to try to go in and, and dabble with the political side of it. It's like you're here just to grow soccer and, and help coaches grow themselves without spending thousands of dollars to have to go somewhere to learn it because it's right here. And, and, and really teaching them about resources that they can utilize to find things to grow themselves as coaches that are at right at their right, you know, right now they're at your fingertips, which is the internet. So uh, there's a lot of information out there and how to use it to their advantage. Last question for you. And thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, one of the, sure. one of the other questions from uh, another one of our uh, Twitch pitch uh, family is how have you seen the game change since you started playing? <laughs> um. Wow, make me feel old. Um, but well, I am. Last, so, uh, since last Tuesday when I'm you started, at, I'm looking at 30 years of soccer, watching it grow and change. You know, the first point on that is obviously the growth of participation and availability for women to play the game uh, at all levels, 
uh, that's been significantly changed uh, primarily in the last 10 years and it's sustaining itself. That's one of the big keys, um, you know, with the pro leagues, especially with NWSL being able to sustain itself after it failed a couple of times. Um, you know, I think the culture of our society has embraced more women's sports and, and I think women talent wise, we had very, very talented women back in the day, but they weren't on a platform where you could see it all the time. And so, you know, now I think the athletes are getting better. I think they're getting smarter. Um, I think they're much more technical than they were. Um, we just had a smaller percentage of that. And now you're seeing the growth at such demand and happening. So f- it happens so not fast, but it really has taken off in the last decade um, for opportunity. And so, you know, we just have to be back in the day. It was like the pool wasn't diluted. And now the pool is so large um, that there's so much talent out there that you really have to figure out uh, a good, really good player versus a great player and and what that, what that looks like now. And that's really where the growth I think has taken off. You know, you look at players like Chloe Ricketts, who was with Ann Arbor last year, she's 15 and she signed a pro contract and she got her first start the other day with the Washington spirit. You know, we never heard of that kind of stuff. 30, 20 years ago. And so now there's those kinds of opportunities where women's players are now bypassing college and playing professionally, like you see in, in men's football, baseball and basketball. And, um, and so that that's the landscape. And that's what's changed significantly uh, throughout the years is opportunity. All right. So tomorrow night, Paladin Stadium on the campus of Furman University, it's uh, Greenville Liberty and FC Carolina, seven o'clock coach. Uh, Julie Carlson, the head coach and technical director for the Greenville Liberty in the W League. Coach, thanks for hanging out with us for a bit of a season preview. We'll be following along, and don't be a stranger. We'll catch up with you soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate it. Have a good day. You too. Coach Carlson has made it through what is going on. We kept her a little extra. We kind of went into added time a little bit because of uh, the questions that uh, you guys have brought in. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, Jarrett, you turn into a pumpkin, yeah? Yep. See All right. So we'll see you tomorrow for a a bunch of other stuff. And uh, since Thursday is today, Friday is weekend whip around in the 10 o'clock hour. So he'll be there and hanging out with us as well. Uh, Before I bring in uh, somebody else here in the 10 o'clock hour, it's time to cut a promo. And uh, because, you know, that's how we transition from one hour to the next. And once again, thanks to uh, thanks to Julie for hanging out with us and letting everybody know what's going on up there in Greenville with uh, USLW. So uh, since it is that time of the show, I have to take the music out of loop and make sure that the level is correct so I'm not blowing anybody out, especially me, since I'm the one reading the promo. So we're at 15. I think that was the agreed upon level. And here we go. For order free, clean, fresh air, one place you need to go. It's a lemonized service. A lemonized deodorizes in closed spaces like houses, apartments, and condos. Lemonai Service has created a customized solution that eliminizes all organic odors, including those like pet cigarettes and food. Realtors and property managers use Lemonai Service to eliminate bad odors to help them sell or rent their homes that much faster. It's a turnkey process, makes it easy to work with realtors and property managers. Kind of the environment we like that these days, a very green way of going about it without uh, having any odors or toxic residue whatsoever when you're done. Different than Febreze or our other masking agents that you have either under the sink or above you in the cupboard because when you reach under the sink or above you in the cupboard you bring that masking agent out you spray it into the air there's a reason they call it a masking agent you're just masking the odor you're not attacking the problem all the way down to the molecule like our friends at eliminate service do with their proven scientific formula pricing one of two ways either by the cubic footer parts per million to come up with a price that's affordable for you offering results in 24 hours or less you have any other questions frequently asked or otherwise this is where i grab my pen because this is when you go to the website eliminize.com but do us a favor here at sdh after the dot com go slash atlanta so they know what part of the world that you are addressing them from so they can help you with your problems your full homework assignment e-l-i-m-i-n-i-z-e.com slash atlanta eliminize.com slash atlanta qr code over my left shoulder for those of you who are watching on twitch eliminize service proto free clean fresh air proud sponsors of everything sdh And you really can't do a slow fade with the way that this thing is set up either. And so because of this, we bring in 
Nick the Paparazzo for hour number two. What is up, Nick? Have, you, have you recovered from yesterday? Everything's going crazy on the board. Everything's going crazy. My God. So have you recovered from yesterday yet? No. No, no, I mean, well, which part? The working or the 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 Milan game? Which the Milan, the Milan game? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm all right with that. That's okay. You know, it happens. Just checking. It happens. We we we've sort of hit a bit of a a, a turbulence, shall we say? So oh. I'm not I'm not necessarily going to, uh, you know, go full DefCon one. Oh my God, the whole world is uh, is is falling apart. You know, because. Uh-huh. Time is our ally, and uh, you know we'll sit tight and see what happens, and and go from there. Uh, Coco, uh, wasting no time to get your thoughts since it's been a, a piece, it's been a fur, it's been a fur piece since you've been here on the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, Coco wants to know your thoughts on the three different cases against Juve. Uh, the, Juve is Juve, and Juve is like uh, the Ric Flair of soccer. <laughs> It, you are always, you know, you're going to do whatever it takes to win. So that means that uh, if you've got a lie, ste- steal, cheat, whatever. It sounds very Eddie Guerrero-ish instead of it, 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 it actually is. It actually is. But, um, you know, Juve parades themselves around as the, as the biggest house, the biggest hill on the biggest side of town. And so to me, that's where Juve lies at the moment. But the, the real issue here is plus Valenza. At the end of the day, the idea that they are going to, uh, you know, they're, they're selling players for more than they're worth. And I, I, I'm going to have to be very careful here. Sure. How do you judge the value of a player? It, it's, you know, if you think about it for a moment, like there's a player who plays slow possession based ball extraordinarily well. What's the value of that player for one of these high pressing sides where it's nothing but physical attributes, you know, we're running fast, we're running hard and, you know, but, player value doesn't transfer across the board evenly. That Mm -hmm. slow possession-based player will be worth a fortune to Barcelona or maybe Ajax, but not to Leipzig. Right. You know, so at the end of the day, I don't understand, like, if you you probably have Juve dead to rights when it comes to cooking the books, you know, like, hey, look, we're going to pay you 1.5 million euro a year. Um, you know, on paper, but off the record, we're going to pay you about 7 million a year like that. They probably have Juve dead to rights on. That's fine. Right. The Like any, anything regarding the plus Valenza scheme. I mean, where's this conversation happening in England? You know, like uh, oh. people, people telling me like Andy Carroll was really worth like 80 million. Like Jackson, I, come on. Jackson Rice, 120 million right. pounds. Right. You, so you can't point to, you know, Italy and say, oh, Juve and, and who I am prime Juve hater number one. But I don't understand where people can look at Italy and say, oh, well, Juve has been boosting the value, the valuation of these players. And it's illegal, but you're going to sit there and point to me any English player who's been yeah. sold over the past 30 years. Yeah. It's going to be the same thing as it happening. Come on. It's, it's come on, get out of here with that. It's, it's stupid. So I, the cooking of the books. Yeah. They're dead to rights on that. Um, you know, I would like to see how UEFA uh, handles this. Uh, I would love to see UEFA kicked out of champions league for two years because, <laughs> you know, them being booted already to city B uh, in 06 and then um, for buying off officials and then, you know, to miss Champions League for two years would just be absolutely hilarious. So but with the player valuation thing to me is stupid. It, it's like uh, it's like when, you know, when Andy Warhol painted the Campbell soup can. Mm-hmm. Right. There were some people who were like, this is not Matisse. This is not Picasso. This is not uh, Modigliani. So there's no value here. But then there was a 
another large portion of the art community who was like, oh my God, it's a masterpiece. It's incredible. It, valuation is not the same across the board. So why Juve gets hammered on this, I have no idea. Please point your energy toward the prim and, and take a look at that. Yes, Ricky, <laughs> waiting on UEFA is like waiting on food in the Popeye's dr drive through It is not coming anytime <laughs> soon. Well, well, you know, they're like, they're, they're actually having to like catch and kill the chicken. And then, you know, you wander around in the parking lot yourself and pick yes. what you want. Yeah. I love, look, no, no, I'm not, there's no Popeye's disrespect here because I will wait for the dark meat uh, three piece spicy combo. Okay. I'm just, I will put that out there. So <laughs> understand that every, because I can't, you know, I'm five, five. So, I, I have nowhere to grow but out, so I have to be very careful with my Popeye's consumption. But the three-piece dark meat spicy combo is worth waiting for. So just please understand that. When, the payoff is there. So if Juve gets booted from Champions League for two years, it will be just like that three-piece dark meat spicy combo because I, you know, it, it's worth the wait. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Coco says South Louisiana Popeyes runs different than outside of Louisiana Popeyes. Well, yeah, I, I would, it's a home game. Yeah, I mean that, that's the only thing that I can I can figure that it's a home game, and so of course it's going to be different. Uh, Coco says it's much faster there than anywhere else. Don't know why, but like I said, it's a home game. You know, it's mm -hmm. like you you got your systems down and everything else. Everybody else is trying to figure out what your system is outside of Louisiana. So. Uh, you know, you're looking at that. Yeah. Uh, yes, Abby, that is absolutely true. Men continue to grow through the years and we always try to figure out how we can stem that tide. Look, I, I've had this conversation before with some people. Growing old is a gift. Growing old is a gift. And it, it, go to go to Sicily during the summer and watch what's happening with those old Sicilian men. They got huge ears, huge nose, and they got like baddies all over the place because they, they embrace the aging process. They don't care. There's literally zero care for growing old. So growing old is a gift. Um, you know, I'm, I will keep the ears trimmed, you know, because you, oh, yeah. you, you can't have the, you can't have the, the ear hair. Yep, right there with uh, you know popping out. You you got to you got to take care of that action. Yep. But the rest of it, you can't do anything about. Uh, at this convention, I was working uh, for the past two days. Uh, I saw a great many gentlemen north of I would say fifty five, sixty, who were wearing like full on hair pieces. Oh no, no, no! Where it's like the hair piece is like uh, magic marker brown, no. and then like the underneath is like white like what little hair oh, they have is white oh no no you look like you have a dead muskrat staple gun to your head don't do it if you're worried about going bald like oh I, I, we could just get the, the the hair plugs and we could get them in the, look jeff bezos could buy the moon and the man is bald okay there's no cure shave your head embrace uh y you know your your inner uh, kojak yeah. Uh, em embrace your Bond villain and just and just let your Lex Luthor and just be bald and be and be proud with it. All right. That's it. Yeah. You know, I had a barber in 2006 who did that to me. That Like I used to do like the, the Jersey Shore. How much product can I put in my hair to try to keep it looking? And the guy said, how do you want it cut? I said, <laughs> however, it's going to look good. He's like, are right, you sure? Like, yeah, yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. Anyway. And he went right down the middle. And as he did it, it wasn't like a quick heat. It was like slow. He said, he said, you're, you're going to thank me. You're going to thank me. Just trust me. You're going to thank me. And I'm telling you that uh, since the age, the ripe young age of 26, my head has been shaved. I have not regretted it for one moment and never in my life will I go get the hair plugs or the dead muskrat staple gun to my head. Ooh. So because at some point it, it, it all you lose it all anyway. And again, Jeff Bezos could buy the moon. The man's bald. So th there's no cure. There's no cure. Don't let the devil's a lie. Don't let it happen. Going gray. Here's my thing. 
I, I go gray. Uh, I love gray hair. Uh, I, like that's my thing. Like go gray hair. La- ladies just, if I mean, do whatever you want to do with it, but love gray hair. Going old's a gift, man. I'm telling you. Um, uh, I mean, you, you have you have definitely sparked a discussion. Uh, Bam is thirty five, shaves his head every couple of days. Yeah, man. Uh, and, and uh, Ricky, uh, to our Popeyes discussion. Mm-hmm. Every, everyone knows every Atlanta based Waffle House is better than any other Waffle House. And yes, I, and hey. I, would, I would also maintain that the lower the safety score from the Department of Health, the better mm-hmm. the food. Yeah, uh, I would say. Um... Statesboro, College Town. Yeah, Statesboro Waffle House is is uh, is is primo. Uh, Valdosta, College Town. Uh, also, um, you know that's also a, a a prime location. So yeah, I, I would expand that to College Town, local Atlanta, and um, and College Town. That would be my uh, the point of order, sir. You know that point, uh, point of order extension and appendices attached to the theorem is that yes, the the Atlanta based Waffle Houses that's right and College Town Waffle Houses mm-hmm. are equal to the task when it comes to the the Waffle House performance. Uh, that's coming, right. Coming up in a half an hour, it is uh, we're going to continue our tour of USLW and catch up with the defending the uh, defending champs, the uh, Jim Robbins, the head coach Ooh. of the Tormenta's women's side, is going to catch up with us. That's right. At, uh, at 1030. Actually, so in 15 minutes, we're going to catch Ooh. up with him for uh, for about 15 minutes or so. And then we'll let you know what's going on today and everything else that's uh, going on. Coco also had a question for you specifically hmm. about uh, Sampdoria. And yeah. it, if it was going to be difficult for them to bounce back from relegation anytime soon. No, um, there's there's talk of, of, of pending bankruptcy as well there. Um, the, the, the main issue that I have been working through mm-hmm. when it comes to Calcio is the resiliency or rather the, the resiliency of the resale value of Northern clubs versus Southern clubs. Yeah. And, uh, the, the big thing for Sampdoria is if Sampdoria goes bankrupt, right. What's the likelihood of a buyer coming in and just dumping resources into that club? It would make sense. You know, it would make sense from the standpoint of they have a very strong fan base. Um, This isn't like um, like some of the other clubs that you see bought and, you know, you're having to resurrect them with very little fan involvement. Um. You know, you're outside of the tourist triangle of Rome, Florence, and Venice. Right. So you're going to have to, you know, figure out how that's going to work. You have a good stadium situation there. uh, On paper, it is attractive, um, probably more attractive than Salernitana or Spezia. But you're also having to look at the fact that when you go bankrupt and you go down to, uh, you know, the Excellenza or uh, Serie D, that it is, it's a, a cocaine fueled knife fight to yeah. get up to like even Serie C. It's, it's an absolute, like they really do their best to make sure those who sink to the bottom stay at the bottom. And so, you know, Italy is having to sort of navigate a crisis of its, if, of its footballing soul. At the moment, you're seeing this uh, through the Oriundi, which is the, the the foreigners who come in to play for the national team. It, you know, we had a, a you know you had players in the, uh, like you know like well, yeah one player in 06 who came from uh, from from Argentina, but now you're seeing it again, and you saw this before where you had Brazilians come in. Um, and it's a huge national debate. Like, well, you know, we are you know, one of the second most World Cups. Why in God's green earth do we have to have these these Oriundi come and help us out? And and they're not developing young players anymore. They are not developing um, and 
a larger international footprint because of their inability to handle racism and their inability to do business deals that benefit everyone instead of like the top three or four. They are unwilling or unable to work with the municipalities to get new business, uh, to get new businesses uh, and new stadiums built. The cities are like, nope, you can't get rid of this, you know, this stadium because this is, you know, the, the city owns it. The city runs it. You see this with uh, in Florence, right? As, as beautiful of a city as Florence is, you have Camiso going head to head with the city council to try to get anything done with uh, with uh, Atameo Franchi. And then so it's, you know, how, what are you supposed to do? There's only one team outright owns their stadium and it's Juventus, right? Uh, uh, you have Allianz Stadium up in Turin. And that's because of the relationship that Juventus has with the city and where the difference is going very quickly into Italian history. After World War II, you had, uh, you, you know, you had that family <laughs> that, that, is the be all and end all, right? Uh, uh, El Avocato Agnelli get, uh, get hold on, to, what the heck is outside my window, man? Oh, I don't know. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So they, they had to rebuild Fiat, yeah, and so Fiat essentially kept uh, uh, Torino operational and the North operational. So they started building. They called them mushrooms. The factories were popping up so quickly. None of that happened in the South, right? None of that happened any further South at all. And so you had a significant amount of private investment that the relationship was there. So when the Agnelli said jump, Torino said, how high? Mm-hmm. And they were able to get their stadium. That, the, that relationship does not exist for anyone else in Italy to the point where as much as we talk about Napoli and their and their Scudetto and, and how great it is that a city from the south was able to make that happen. Uh, De Laurentiis actually owns Bari as well. And he bought Bari because uh, Naples would not move on doing anything to fix the to fix the stadium. And he and Bari was like, yo, fix the stadium. Do whatever you want to do, man. We don't care. And so there's a situation now where if Bari gets promoted to Serie A, that De Laurentiis would have to sell either Bari or, or Napoli. And from a money-making standpoint, which one is is is, it, is he going to be able to do, right? Because if he's able to own Bari and get the stadium fixed up and make it a top flight situation, that long term could be a better investment for him. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it, it short story long. Yeah. Um there's a lot of things that could go well for Sampdoria. There's a lot of things that could go really really wrong for Sampdoria. Um, and yes, uh, Mataflo says it. The uh, economic disparity between the north and south is crazy. You saw this when uh, Napoli won the Scudetto, and they flew the Italian um, emblem up, like the, the 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 shield upside down, which is a sign over there of, of like a it's a war celebration because Naples and the, the everywhere south of of that. Italy is a very young country for a long time. It was a collection of city states and that mentality has not left. And so, you know, it post-World War II, Rome North was being rebuilt with, you know, pipes and wires and infrastructure. And from South of Rome, they were using donkeys and carts. So it was like the reconstruction after the civil war in the South and high-end infrastructure upgrades in the north and you know you see a brain drain uh my cousins moved from uh Siracusa up to milan and to bergamo because that's where the money and the opportunities were so it's yeah the disparity the disparity is crazy uh jim robbins head coach for a uh, tormentous women's side coming on in about five minutes to talk about the uh, the defending champs in the USL Women's League. And so uh, Coco with another question. So to bring it home to the Americans, does Venezia have any uh, 
hope of coming back to Syria next year. I know this year's promotion is sunk for them. No, no, they don't. Um, they have tried doing Moneyball uh, to Moneyball their way into the into the city. I I don't see that happening. They have to decide if they're a brand or if they are uh, if they are a brand or if they're like an actual sporting business. Yeah. And um, that's not any disrespect to them because for they, they, I think they have done the absolute most that they could with the resources given until they get a stadium over near Marco Polo international. Uh, and they're stuck with uh, the Penzo. I, I don't see how they can get the sort of economic investment necessary to get that team and keep that team in Syria. I don't know how that works. If they can make that work, God bless them. But I have no idea how you can sustain that team long-term. And, and speaking of uh, brand building, their uh, online store is having a sale, by the way. So if you would like to, to dive into uh, Venezia's gear from the 22-23 season, uh, remember that if you do purchase – You've got to go up a couple of sizes. The further away you go from the United States, when it comes to purchasing things, you've got to continue to add X's. So add probably two sizes to what you normally are, maybe three. And then that way you'll be in line with what you get. So that way you're not ending up buying a medium for yourself when you purchase something from a European football club. This is why... When I, when I shop this time of year, I'm buying five and six X's from England and all the teams that are going down and all that kind of stuff. Because once it is in the washer, it shrinks, and you're not, yeah, you're looking at like a 6X, and you're going, oh, my God, why are you buying a 6X? Because when it shrinks, it's more your size. So add a couple of X's if you're going to shop for things overseas because of the shrinkage factor. Well, that, I mean, Modaflow, to a degree, we are a chunk country, but I'm also, I don't want you to buy something. I mean, like when I buy something from Canada, I add a size because of the shrinkage factor. When I buy stuff from overseas, I start adding at least two. John, John we, we don't, we don't, uh, these jerseys aren't shrinking, boss. We're growing. No, it's, well, at the, the what, I'm saying, <laughs> what, what, what I'm saying is that when we put them in the washer, and I'm doing the washing and the laundry. Uh -huh. There is a propensity for them to shrink. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm allotting for my laundry error when I buy something. Well, also, if, if it's a Kappa, if, if, if it's a Kappa uh, kit, then those are yes. built for extraordinarily thin individuals they, so they, they, are, they are kappas across the board yeah so kappa especially you have to any there are certain kits that you know run super slim puma has a tendency to run slim kappa runs slim adidas has a history of running uh, a bit more normal size so nike nike's hit or miss in that department but kappa and puma are like you you better be doing like, uh, you know, mega dieting and, and all kinds of, you know, uh, spa treatments or whatever, like quick frozen weight loss activities. If you're trying to fit into those things, unless if you're not going up a size or two. Yes. So because we so chunk. That, yeah, that that's your that's your public service for the morning. Uh, I have Modiflow does have questions on how you're getting polyester to shrink in the wash. Dude, you've never seen me do laundry. Wait, are you drying your jerseys? air i don't okay. i don't i don't go i don't go like dryer dryer unless okay. it's done by accident no i i i specifically will air dry uh will air dry all of the mm -hmm. jerseys. are you washing them on hot or cold like what do you like I, i'm trying to figure out how you're you're getting them to shrink but maybe shrink. that's a conversation for another day no 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 uh marathon from ecuador runs slim but is stretchy niche, mm -hmm. niche market but good to know but like i said it's nothing wrong model flow there's absolutely nothing wrong yeah see coco hang up the jerseys after i wash them inside out see i don't do the inside out part but um that's uh you know that that's uh that's what i do and maybe and maybe we can ask this guy uh, about how he with all of the stuff that, that he has to wear with tormenta how mm -hmm. long he's done to make sure that things are 
are squared away. So uh, we now bring in, as we yes, it is jersey maintenance down here. We now bring in the head coach of the USOW side for South Georgia Tormenta, Jim Robbins. Coach, we, we, we've we started talking about laundry before uh, you came on. And specifically, you know, when it comes to me and doing laundry, it is uh, an adventure. And so I usually will have to buy like a size or two up because of shrinkage, because if I mistakenly put something in the dryer or I really screw it up, when it comes to laundry there in Statesboro, how is it done? Now, is it done successfully? Is there a shrinkage? What's, uh, how successful is laundry there in Statesboro when it comes to you and getting to wear all the Tormenta stuff? I'm going to say it depends on who does it down here. You know, we got, we got Colt. He's our guy. So he does it for uh, all the players. So I know he does an A plus 4.0 type of job there. Yeah, for <laughs> me... Yeah, that's that's a whole different story. Whole different story. I, I just bought a new jacket the other day, and you know, I, I thought I was an extra large. Maybe I'm not anymore. I don't know. You know, age kicking in on me. So I bought a two X. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll size up just in case. You know, trying to play those factors there, John, just in case it shrinks a little bit, or you know, have too many cokes and too many chocolate bars on the way to these games. But uh, it's always an adventure. You know that. Always. Yeah. An adventure. Exactly. And so that's, I just wanted to double check to make sure that I was on an island because I traditionally will buy things at least two sizes up to allow for laundry shrinkage. Yeah. Uh, reason that uh, Nick and I had you on the show this morning is that you, you kind of have something starting uh, coming up in a couple days. And it's uh, the defending a title. What is it? What has this offseason been like? Well, first off, where's the trophy? Where, where is the trophy, by the way? That's a great question. Uh, it's not at my house. So, no, I think they, uh, it's going to be up in the clubhouse. They have it in the office. So, uh, it's here. It's getting a lot of views, you know, from everybody coming in and out uh, of the restaurant there. But, uh, yeah, Darren Nietzsche, they, they, they got it up there proudly. Well, what's it been like as a defending champ? What's this offseason been like for a Tormenta W? Well, it's been pretty exciting. I mean, we, we obviously, we started the uh, recruitment process for this year's team. You know, that was basically August 1st. You know, once the college season started and, you know, it, it was good in terms of, you know, we're sending out emails and making some calls. And, and now we got a little bit of street credibility that we're you know, able to, to sort of flaunt, you know, for those coaches. Hey, come to us. Here's what we offer. Here's what we did last year. Uh, so I think that that helped our, you know, sort of the scope, you know, and the radius of our recruiting for this year. I mean, we we knew going in after last year that, you know, last year's team was really built you know, sort of as a, a one and done to, to use the basketball terms. Um, you know, we, we only have three returning players from last year's team. So we needed 22 because we do keep a tighter roster here. Um, but yeah, the, the reception on the other end was fantastic. I mean, had a lot of great conversations with college coaches, you know, it really trying to build out the network in terms of you know, agents and, and you know, bringing in players who are internationals. So it, it opened up that you know, sort of recruiting pocket as well. And, and, you know, we are really happy with, with where the team is right now. We're excited to get to the first game. You know, we, we got here May 1st, you know, last year I, I looked at my notes. We, we started with five kids last year, you know, for the first eight or nine days and, and look how that turned out. And we started last Monday with uh, 11 or 12 kids. You know, we'll have the full roster here uh, starting Tuesday. So we'll be minus one game, um, but full roster will be in and, we're really excited for where it's going to go, but uh, you know, definitely that really helped to lay the groundwork and, and create a platform for us that that we didn't think we would have. Nick Alifi for Jim Robbins, go for it. So uh, my dad, uh, our family's all down in Savannah, and so uh, he told me about a time that his his team of older guys played. Uh, I guess the embryotic stage of uh, Tormenta's women's team. And he said, okay, the first time we, you know, we ran them off the field and they came back a couple weeks later and they, they drew even with us. And at each time that we played them, they grew in skill and, and, you know, cohesiveness exponentially to go from that to a title team in a very, very short period of time. How, did, what was the process for you guys to get this from where it, you know, you, you had a collection of players to a title and what, from in sporting terms, virtually overnight? What was your, your process for that? 
I think it, it really comes down to you know, a, a couple things, maybe some that we tried to control here and, and maybe some that are you know, sort of uh, controlled for the players. And sort of what I mean by that is, you know, as coaches, as you guys both know, you know, we take every training session, we take every game. You know, what do we learn from that? What do we have to work on for the next session, for the next game? So we, we sort of took it piece by piece there. You know, we realized what we did well and, and what areas we need to work on. Um, you know, we made a couple tactical adjustments as the season went on and, and moved a couple of players around. You know, so I think that was the part, you know, really that we controlled that led to that transformation a little bit. I think the other side that I think some people may not know or understand is, you know, and this is what we tell all the women who come here, that our environment is fully professional. What we mean by that is you know, Darren and Nietzsche, they they provide housing for all the players here in Statesboro all together. You know, we have all our meals here all together you know, in the clubhouse. Uh, and I think those those interactions that the women have away from the field you know, and it is something as simple as you know having lunch together seven days a week you know having breakfast you know those kind of things in addition to you know the bus trips and, and all those things i think that really was a it was probably a bigger deciding factor for us was just that you know our ability to have those kids be together and interact almost 24 7 I'm not sure any other teams in the league, you know, really have that or offer that. Um, but you know, like I said, doing this 31 years now, I'm not going to say that that wasn't key because it was super, super important. I think to our, you know, the success as the season rolled on. And we caught up with uh, Julie Carlson from Greenville Liberty in hour number one. And coming into a season, there's always the 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 really random reach outs from players and trying to figure out, okay, so uh, I have a player from Europe who's reaching out to me on WhatsApp to be a part of this process. As a defending champ, how widespread were the contacts to try to be a part of Tormenta this year, considering what you've established now in a championship atmosphere and pedigree? What what were the offseason conversations like for players that wanted to get involved? How wide reaching was this? It, it was. It really surprised us. It was sort of like we said before, you know, the the outbound communications that we had went very very well. Uh, the inbound communications, whether that you know comes through the sort of the that uh, link that we have, you know, if you're interested, you know, fill this out, and that information comes to me. Um, but we had some agents, you know, reach reach out directly to us. You know, we thought we were going to get a a five year professional player out of Venezuela. You know, we really worked to get her and and that turned out to be you know a little bit of a visa passport issue but i mean this this I mean, this woman was fantastic outside back i mean i think she was three time uh, league player of the year you know and and the sort of the contact was uh, her agent knew someone who helped get one of the players here on our men's side so we were i mean super close to getting her I mean, I think the the surprise for us is I, I had a gentleman reach out to me out of Florida and he's like, hey, here's who I am. And I, I didn't know him from anybody. You know, here's who I am. I got a player who, um, you know, racing Louisville just signed. I have, uh, you know, one of her teammates down here in Florida. She's going to a community college. You know, I tried to get her there. I know about you guys at Tormenta, blah, blah, blah. Would you be interested? Yeah, send me send me some film. Said, oh, my. This girl can play. <laughs> she can play. So. You know, keep your eyes on Celine Ota, a Nigerian full national team player as a 19-year-old, you know, going to junior college in Florida. I mean, she got, got to Statesboro on Monday, first training session Tuesday. Where are we today? This kid can play. I mean, two days in, we're like, wow. So, you know, if, if, that, if that's any indication as to how last year helped us for this year, I mean, that this kid is going to be fun and exciting. And, I mean, everybody here is talking about her, and, and she is the most – humble, down-to-earth, personable player. But I told my wife last night, how's it going? I said, you should have saw Celine, Meg, three of our teammates in the first possession game yesterday. These kids had no idea what was going on. And all of a sudden, toe poke Meg. You're like, wow, okay. This girl's at a different level. But no, it's too fun. Oh, Nick, go for it. So we're, we're at the time of year when a lot of kids are graduating high school, right? Or the, And they're looking for what those next steps are going to be. 
they're probably having highlight videos made. They're probably, you know, putting together their packages for colleges and whatnot. As, as a coach, I imagine you receive a fair amount of these videos. What do you look for? For parents out there who are like, you know, I, how do I get, you know, a package that will get my kid noticed? What's the first thing you look for as a coach when you get inundated with these videos? It's a great question. I, I think you know, maybe it's my age a little bit, but I know, you know, when we first went through the coaching schools way back in the early mid nineties, it was, you know, what are the four pillars, you know, technique, tactics, psychology, fitness, you know, we, we were sort of drilled that uh, back in those days, but still, I mean, they have to have a certain base level of technique, regardless of position that they play experience the whole nine yards. So for me, you know, especially the way that we want to play, you know, we are, are very much a uh, little bit more of a tight possession type of team. You know, we want to circulate the ball around. We want to play with one and two touches. So that is probably the highest priority uh, in terms of us, you know, looking for players, you know, having a, a good tactical understanding, you know, of the game is, is also critical. You know, I'm, I don't think we're, we're a club or we're a program that, that, prioritizes you know, height and speed and athleticism. You know, I think if that comes in as a bonus, you know, that, that obviously helps. Um, but um, yeah, so we're, we're looking for kids who you know, have those skill sets too that fit in with what we're trying to do. You know, we're, we're, I think this year we want to try to go to you know, sort of a possession buildup where we can get into this 2-3-5 shape or this 3-2-5 shape you know, as we get into the final third. So you know, we need kids who can take care of a ball, who can get themselves down the field, who can combine in tight spaces. Uh, so it's it's really those couple things that that are of interest to us. Um, like I said, for our team, you know, it, a lot of times a you know, little individuality can't. It's not going to hurt you either. But uh, we have a nice mixture of skill sets here, and it's going to be a fun, challenging season for us to try to put this together. But for like I said, anybody who's interested in us, I mean, those are a couple things that are important. You're in the uh, the South Central this year, and your first match is in Austell this weekend up against uh, SSA. And when you look at the rest of the division, you look at the teams that are going to be a part of this, uh, part of it with you in the Southeast, uh, what are you looking at for the folks that are in the division? Because you've got Chattanooga is there, SSA is there, uh, Tennessee SC is a part of this. When you look at the rest of your division, what do you see? I think it's going to be similar to last year where it really, in my opinion, it really was a tight group from top to bottom. I mean, yeah, we, we, we had a couple lopsided results at the end of the season, you know, but I think that was really due to, um, you know, roster issues on uh, by our opponents, you know, not being able to come down and field a full team. But, you know, other than that, I mean, every game was close. Uh, every game was competitive. So we expect that same thing. Um, you know, our goal, you know, is obviously to get to that July 23rd game, but uh, we know it's not going to be easy. And I think if you ask anybody, you know, in our division, any of the coaches, uh, that I think they would all agree that we we may have one of the toughest divisions in the entire league down here. So uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, so, but somebody made mention that the other day that you know, obviously the USLW champion came out of our group. I mean that that could again happen this year. I mean I think that that sort of upper Midwest group is going to be tough again. I think that far West group out of California is going to be tough. Um, but I, I don't think there's really any easy game on our schedule that I'm looking at. Yeah. And I'm hoping that the players do the same, that they know that, you know, we got to bring our best 90 minutes on Sunday if we want three points. Tennessee SC, South Carolina, United FC, North Alabama SC, Birmingham Legion diving in. Tormenta is there with Chattanooga and SSA. That's your South Central Division. Nick, go for it. Uh, okay, where where in Austell? Because people people need to know where in Austell, John, we can we can go and watch this game. All right, because it, it's it's not terribly far from us, and we're wanting to. And there may be some people who are tuning in and hearing about all of this for the first time. And I want to make sure that they they hear where to go and what to do because we're not gatekeeping information around here. Where can they go to watch this game? All right, Coach, cut the promo for me. Where are you heading? Uh, Marathon Park. Austell, Georgia, 7.30 kickoff Sunday. We will see you there. <laughs> yeah, we'll be coming in the big bus. Look out for us. <laughs> see, there you go. That's your promo. Coach, thanks for coming on, especially as you're getting ready for the first week of the season. Really tough division. Defending champs, 
It's going to be really cool to see everything. Thanks for coming on with us. We'll keep an eye on the schedule and we'll catch up with you really soon. That sounds great. Thanks, guys. Have a great rest of the day. Jim Robbins, head coach of Tormenta's women's side and uh, defending champs in the league, sir. Yeah, we, we need to find out about game streams for people yep. who can't uh, get out. Tradition, to... Traditionally, Coco and Bam, uh, it's on 11 sports or it's done individually by the teams. So uh, 11, E-L-E-V-E-N sports is where they are traditionally. Uh, so keep an eye there. Uh, Tormenta is very, very good about posting where things can be seen, where they can be found, those kinds of things. So uh, as a public service to BAM and, and Coco and everybody else uh, that want to know, Sunday night where you can catch uh, this particular act out of the, the South Central Division with Tormenta, your defending champs in USLW, heading to SSA. Keep an eye on their social media platforms. And they will be more. They will. They will let you know where you can watch it. They'll give you the the updates and everything. And just so, uh, just so you know, it is Tormenta W League on Twitter. At Tormenta W League on Twitter is where you can follow along with uh, the Tormenta uh, in the USLW as they chase after a uh, a back to back title in USLW League and their. Uh, in the returning players to watch category, coach mentioned one of his new players, uh, Autumn Cayelli for Greenville Liberty that we had uh, Julie Carlson on in hour number one, five goals in the Academy Cup, Golden Boot Best 11, South Carolina commit returning to the uh, Liberty for the this particular season. And also uh, Ellis Nemtsov for South Georgia Tormenta, second leading goal scorer uh, for them last year. And she's going to have, uh, obviously, with... Uh, the folks in the turnover that we had last uh, from last season to this season, Elis Nemtsov, keep an eye on her for South Georgia Tormenta. Uh, Gigi Espinoza for a Southern Soccer Academy for SSA. 18-year-old Mexican youth national team regular returns to SSA. You've got Maggie Shaw, the, a two-time SOCON Defensive Player of the Year in Chattanooga. So when Coach was saying that this particular conference is going to be one of the tightest and most competitive in the W League, he wasn't kidding. So you've got you've got a lot of stuff going on with uh, South Georgia Tormenta. Very very cool stuff there, and it was great for. And once again, thanks to the Liberty, and thanks to Coach Carlson, and thanks to uh, Edwin Pintor and everybody down at Tormenta for uh, letting us catch up with Coach Robbins in a game week as they're getting ready to start mm -hmm. their. Season. We'll have a lot more of these interviews with the USLW sides because we want to catch up with everybody in the division that is going after it. Uh, yes, we do. We stand Tormenta in this SDH network. That yeah, is, yeah, yeah. They get the bump. Yeah, they get the bump. They absolutely get the bump as a as a defending champ and as someone who has been a part of the been a part of the ride with us in in our seventh season here of doing Soccer's Morning Show. They definitely do get the bump, and so uh, you know it's great to catch up with them. However, we can catch up with them on uh, on a daily basis. Well, I mean, it, it, there's a reason. It's not just because they're. They're in the state, right? I mean, what the Van Tassels are doing down there. It, for those who are out of state or out of country listening to the show, mm -hmm. Statesboro, Georgia, f like it, it was known, it used to be known for Georgia Southern and being at the top party school in the nation. And that was it. That was it. That was all Statesboro was known for. And now you have two champions. Mm-hmm under the same roof with Tormenta there. They they have when when they talk about growing clubs from literally the dirt up. Mm -hmm. You're that's what the Van Tassels have done out there and it is something that is that is just spectacular when you have uh, uh, you know it's it's sort of the the holy grail of what we have been talking about for so many years mm -hmm. here in these United States of America, you know, whenever you would talk to the, um, the prim faces and they would say like, we know well, hey, we grew a team from nothing out and they uh, used to be the longshoremen who would, yeah. Okay, great. Everyone has these legendary stories about how their team grew from like longshoremen or fishermen or uh, manufacturers, or the factory workers or whatever. But, Tormenta is really doing that. Mm -hmm. Like they are really doing that from the ground up. And, and I'm not kidding. Uh, my, my dad and my uncle and a group of these older guys 
they were asked to scrimmage Tormenta's women's team when they were still in their early, early phase. And when I said, you know, dad said, well, yeah, we ran them off the field. He wasn't bragging. He was really saying like, look, they weren't good at all when they first started. And two weeks later, it was, they, they were even with us. Mm -hmm. Like it, you know, the program that they have going on there where you have that kind of growth from like discombobulated mess, coherent and competitive Mm -hmm. to champions that, I mean, you, you, Mm -hmm. you'd be hard pressed to find any team that would not be 112% good with that (laughs) that process in that short a period of time, man. So it's, uh, you know, it's just really impressive what, what they're doing down there. And, and to me, that's, if you are anywhere in the U S right now, and you're wondering about what a soccer pyramid looks like, and I'm not getting into the conversation that people think this is going in, but if you want to have the U S be competitive in a world cup situation, it's not about making sure Atlanta, Los Angeles, DC, Chicago, um, you know, St. Louis are, are producing U S men's national team level talent. It's about small places like Des Moines, uh, places like Chattanooga, places like Statesboro, Jacksonville, um, you know, uh, you know, Columbus, Georgia, they're the ones who are producing, you know, talent and giving options for kids to play at a much higher level than what, I had access to growing up, right. You know, I'm, I'm 42 and it was, you play like bootleg rec league and that's it. You know, there's nowhere else to go. You know, there was no real professional option. So even if you went to college, okay, great, but you weren't, you know, so it, it was in MLS back in the old days was, I mean, it was boom ball central. It was like, okay, how far can we kick the ball and run, you know, yep. but you have now, uh, you know, teams that are hyper competitive coming out of the gate and getting investment and in resources. You know, I think that's one thing that the people have, you heard it, you heard the coach say like they, they have all their players living there, mm-hmm. you know, like there are a lot, I mean, their teams probably in, um, um, you know, the, the top flight women's league that would be more than happy with the accommodations that are being provided uh, by the Van Tassels down there. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on, on all of that stuff. Uh, we do have a bit of an update. We do have gossip rumor and innuendo Ooh. and uh, things left unsaid before we go. Um, but uh, I mean, first time ever in, in uh, American soccer history that you had a, 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 a club get a men's and a women's title first time ever in a, in, in a, in a season that you had one particular club get both a men's and women's title happen last year with Tormenta in league one and uh, with the W league uh, Bam letting us know in uh, football down here, which is over on the OSG sports side of things. The Jags are going to play 25 and 26 games in London. They're also going to play back to back this year in London. May as well just go ahead and move them. Just play them in Craven cottage and get it over with considering what Shad Khan, uh, you know, is, is doing with, with all that stuff. It's, 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 it's unbelievably, look, I, I'm sorry. I know NFL <laughs> wants a team in England. Yeah. You know, they want to grow the game internationally. Um, no, that it, it's, it's terrible for the fan base to have, you know, your players on international flight to go over and play And then turn around and come back. You have your bye week where instead of flying back from, say, uh, you know, San Diego at the farthest, right? San Diego, Los Angeles, Seattle, uh, Seattle, uh, you know, but to do an international flight in that short a period of time after a competitive game. And then there's your bye week there. Yeah. I'm uh, no. Uh, uh-uh, because your bye week's not really a bye week, even. It's not even like a rest and recovery week. It's like, okay, we got to get players not only physically ready to play again next week, but they got to get over being jet lagged and they have to get over. No, it's it, 
you know, there, there's, there was talk that uh, Shad Khan, uh, you know, with, with the, with the, um, you know, had made inroads to keep the team in Jacksonville. They had the highest number of season ticket requests. Um, you know, there's a lot of faith and hope in that team because of that young core that they have, but, Man, putting a team in England is just yeah. I know. Unless you're going to do it as a part of NFL Europe and make it a separate thing, it's just that's insane. Yeah. Uh, all right. So gossip, rumor, and innuendo before uh, we we head out. Uh, Hugo Lloris has an offer to play in Saudi Arabia next season, triple his current salary at Spurs. Arsenal set to announce an extension to Bukayo Saka's contract until 2028 from our friend Fabrizio mm-hmm. Romano. Newcastle have revived their interest in Leicester's James Madison. Liverpool interested in signing uh, Chuameni from Real Madrid, even if it eventually if, if initially means a loan deal. Spurs also want to secure a replacement for former managing director Fabio Paratici before finalizing plans to bring in a new manager. Uh, Man City have turned their attention to Chelsea's Mateo Kovacic as an alternative to Jude Bellingham, who apparently has agreed to contract terms with Real Madrid, but has not. They have not agreed on transfer fee as of yet. That mm-hmm. happened this morning. Uh, Liverpool poised to sign Hanover 96's uh, Ron Robert Zeeler as a backup keeper. Say that 10 times fast. Uh, Wolves interested in signing Coventry City striker Victor Jokeresh. PSG set to lose Mbappe with Real Madrid's pursuit of the 24-year-old back on. Napoli, Napoli have increased their asking price for Victor Osimhen to 160 million euro in anticipation of a bidding war for the striker. that comes. Get from- money. Il Matino. Get money. I, I, look, I, Mbappe. I, I have zero love for PSG. Um, I, I, I simply just don't care. Uh, they're going to lose Messi to MLS or Saudi Arabia. Um, they're going to lose uh, the great rolling wonder from Brazil to uh, you know to wh- whomever is going to. Rumor was that he was going to go to Milan on loan. Um, that that's fine. I'm okay with that. Um, that team. If you ever wanted to know how much mental, how much of a role mentality plays in the success of a team, look at Spurs and look at PSG, right? So mm-hmm. where you have a decent roster with 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 Spurs, um, who, who chronically underperforming is not even like an accurate statement anymore it's like who they are it, yeah it's 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 their dna when chiellini is getting up on television and be like this is uh this is who uh this is the spurs this is their this is who they are it is a uh, known you know italians don't pay attention to anything outside of italy so for chiellini to be like yeah this is who spurs are we know it even here um it, it's it's absurd your reputation is that massive from that perspective. And then PSG who has every resource on God's green earth Mm -hmm. and they still, still can't get to the final, still can't win at all mentality, baby. It's all mentality. It's, it's like Miami people say, Oh, well, you know, Miami's getting this guy. I'm sorry. They have South beach. They're never winning another title. Like (laughs) outside of the NBA, they're never winning another title. You, You can't keep people's heads on straight with South beach right there. Uh, it's Paris. You can't keep people's heads screwed on straight when they're in Paris. I'm sorry. So, yes. yeah. In Real Madrid, you have to play well because there's so much talent there that if you don't play well, you're going to be seeing the streets. So, you know, and they, I mean, look at, look at Bale. They benched Bale when he decided he was going to go do a walkabout on 18 instead of, uh, instead of trying to be mentally focused for the game. So, you know, mentality means everything. Uh, AC Milan's Rafael Leal, who has been linked to Liverpool and Chelsea, has signed a new five-year deal with the Italian club. That, to me, That's sounds right. more like controlling the asset. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, there were some uh, issues with his original club uh, that, uh, like, I want to say it was like a 25 million euro fine or something to that effect that had to be negotiated. And that was the sticking point for the contract Leal is happy in Milan. He is loved and, and he's really grown tremendously as a player. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is, it's all about controlling the asset, making sure that after some high profile uh, 
contract expirations and walkings without anything to show in return. Uh, Milan is sort of getting their head screwed on straight when it comes to transfer strategy. Coco, we have not talked about the Spanish tax man coming for Barca. Is this new? Uh, a new tax man? Uh, a new tax man coming for Barcelona? And uh, or is this a continuation of uh, any of everything else that is uh, that's been going on? A new one? I mean, that's what I'm gonna say. Is there a new one, or is this, uh, or is this something else? Uh, oh, it is. Oh, 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 it's new. A payment oh, regularity. Man. Payment there, regularity. There was okay. So after after uh, after Biggie and Tupac got shot, uh, there was the song called "Running" uh, that was it's absolutely amazing where they met, they mixed up Tupac and Biggie and uh, I want to say Eminem produced, uh, produced the track, but there's a clip in there where they have Biggie talking about Tupac. So, you know, Tupac was always getting shot or shot at, but when he died, I was like, Whoa, you know, because even when we were going through our beef, I would never wish death on anyone. Cause there's no coming back from that. It, 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 I feel like this is Barcelona with the tax man. It's like, they're always getting tax. You know, the tax man is always coming, you know, shooting at, <laughs> Or, or shooting them, it, it, you know, but now when it, they finally get them, it's like, whoa, wow, okay, this is happening. So it, they are habitual line steppers, habitual line steppers in Barcelona. All the years we were like, wow, it's the model way to run a club. No, they weren't. <laughs> they, they were, they were, um, my brain's going blank. Who's the, the cyclist? Lance Armstrong. Uh-huh. They, you know, everybody was like, "Oh, Lance Armstrong, he's this the great story. He's a cancer survivor, and he's winning the Tour de France repeatedly." No, he wasn't. He was on steroids. Stop this. Take those yellow wristbands off because it's it's all a lie. It's Barcelona is a lie. Talking about well, we play beautifully. No, you don't. You <laughs> juice up your contracts, man. You're on financial steroids. Get out of here. The Spanish tax authorities have fined Barcelona 15 million euro for alleged payment irregularities, courtesy of our friends at El Confidencial. They're trying to make sure that Barcelona doesn't get messy. They don't want Messi coming back. Not Barcelona. that they could. Not that they could find a way to get him in the first place. No, they couldn't. They can't afford this. They can't afford this. It's they can't afford. They can't afford it. I, I love they're like so and so is rumored to be a target of Barcelona yeah. with what money? Exactly. We like uh, you know, are, are we mortgaging Park Place Boardwalk in Arizona Avenue to make this deal happen? You know, uh, you can't. Like it's you can't. Soccer it's, in Arizona Avenue. Look, you you know, uh, look. I, I I'll trade you Pacific Avenue and Baltic states for. No, come on. Baltic Ave, States Ave, and um, uh, what is it? Uh, B&O Railroad to extend Gavi. Like, <laughs> that's what you're doing right now. Like, how the mighty have fallen. Uh-huh. That place that is has been perpetually packed out mm-hmm. for the past 20 years, and they can't get their books right. And you put you put it you put a lo, you put a, a logo of like what Spotify, yeah, of, of one of the artists on your jersey, to, yeah, because you're what the the Spotify, uh, count new or whatever it is or whatever the the deal is, yeah. And there was a time when they when they had no sponsor on the front of their kit. I remember there was a there was a time when Barcelona refused to have a sponsor on the front of their kit, and the first sponsor they put on was UNICEF. Mm-hmm. And, be, and they, be, because they were high and mighty and said, well, we do not need this. We will not desecrate the club of our, the, uh, you know, our, our club's shirt because of uh, the, you know, the, the sponsors and whatnot. We are certainly greater than this. Uh, and, and now they're going to be looking like defense at Justicia where the, even the Sox have separate sponsors. So, uh, well, yes. So, uh, if you would like to sponsor the left sock, uh, that is, uh, that's a, a two hundred thousand euro, and the right sock would be a three hundred and fifty thousand euro, mm-hmm. because because of what? Because you got caught playing Monopoly money, man. Mm-hmm. Jesus, yeah, stupid, man. Uh huh. Uh, other stuff going on. Uh, Liverpool ready to meet the sixty million euro release clause for Sporting Lisbon's midfielder Manuel Ugarte. Manchester United monitoring Latar Martinez. 
England's uh, Aaron Ramsdale close to agreeing to a no, new long-term deal at Arsenal. Sunderland planning to fan, to offer Jack Clark a new deal to keep interest away from Crystal Palace and Brentford. Barcelona's Rafinha, who has been linked with Newcastle, has rubbished claims. He's open to a move away from the new camp this summer. But if new, but if Newcastle is going to drop eighty million, Barcelona is going to sit there and go, "Yep." They're running into the same problem, though. They're they're running into the same problem. I don't care who is in charge of Newcastle. I don't care how much money they offer in a transfer fee. You still have to make an agreement with the player. And you're trying to tell me that a player wants to leave Barcelona to go to Newcastle? Where would you like to be in January, son? Would you like to be would you like to be playing football in Iowa in 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 January or would you like to be playing in Miami? Mm-hmm. Or LSU? Mhm or Florida state. I, I mean, come on, man. Like it, I, these players already have enough money to orbit, uh, you know, the, the, have their own little orbital space platform and, and they get to live in a really good weather place mm-hmm. like Barcelona or Madrid. I mean, Milan can get pretty cold, but you have f- fantastic living conditions or you can go, up to a place where I don't know, uh, you, you go to Newcastle, the weather sucks and, and, and the British media are hacking your phone nonstop. Yeah. Why would you want to deal with that? Yeah. Uh, today on uh, the television, uh, two to NA has your Europa league semi of Juve Sevilla at three, uh, Liga MX quarterfinals. It is Atlas, uh, Guadalajara, Tigres and Toluca, eight thirty and 11. Uni Mas has your, uh, simulcast of Juve and Sevilla. Galasso Network has West Ham and uh, Azed Alkmaar at three. Brazilian Bra- uh, Brazil- Brasileiro at six with Botafogo and Corinthians. Paramount Plus has uh, Europa-, Europa League semis, Europa Conference League semis, three matches in the Brasileiro. VIX Plus has both your Europa League semis and your Europa Conference League semis. All of that is at three o'clock. Uh, I'm trying to see. Oh, uh, by the way, and, and uh, color me shocked by this before we go. Mm-hmm. Watford make Valerian Ismail the 19th manager in 11 years. Valerian Steele. That sounds like something from a George R. R. Martin book. Watford have appointed their 19th full-time 19th manager, manager in 11 Good years. Lord. Who runs the Iron Throne at Watford? The Pozzo family. Oh, God. <laughs> hey, 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 Alex, if you want to catch the Gom Jabbar, by all means, son. Oh, by all means. I only speak truth. Yeah, it's just the, the <laughs> noted of- Newcastle fan, Alex Pacine, ready to defend Newcastle's honor. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So the Pozzo family, 19th full time hire in 11 seasons. Way to go. Insanity. Yes. That Insane. Is, I, I, again, if you're a manager, why take that job? And, yep. unless, you, unless you really need it, why take well, the job? Well, you've got him away from Besiktas. I mean, that's, that's, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, I get uh, it. I get it. Todd Bowley and Bedadik Bali are freezing Chelsea season ticket prices to appease uh, disgruntled fans. And today's required requested reading, if you can uh, hang on to it, uh, John Percy over at the Telegraph did a really good deep dive about West Brom and how they're staring financial peril right in the face. This yeah, small battle royal. <laughs> the, the 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 jokes that would be fired off from Ooh. from a Nick and Alex small battle royale would just it would it would stop the internet. Look, it'd be, it'd be epic. The business model for for soccer across the board right now is unsustainable. It's unsustainable, and. We're watching it play out right now with nation states. The minute nation states got involved in purchasing, I, I you, we could talk about the ethics of the individual nation states on a separate time, separate topic. Mm-hmm. The money that is being put in by now that the Rus- Russian oligarchs have been largely pushed out uh, of, of the model, and now it's you know Saudi Arabia, Dubai, uh, Qatar, uh, you know. And where American billionaires look like smaller fish in this pond, you you are creating 
a situation where it is impossible to compete, where even the television money of the mighty prem cannot help these clubs. You can't do that. Like uh, it, it, it's not going to work. So as much attention as we focus on the big clubs, like the, the, the blue bloods, the, you know, the, the clubs that have gone, you know, to win silverware after silverware after silverware. Don't forget that it wasn't long ago that Chelsea was a mid to lower end team perpetually, not like, you know, once in a blue moon dropping down, like with regularity. Mm-hmm. There was a time that Man City uh, thought that, um, uh, what, 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 I'm trying to remember the guy's name. Mark but, Hughes. Let's yeah, Mark Hughes was the was the was the great managerial signing. Ooh. Ooh. Uh and, and uh you know they they would sign like they had players that they would sign that were like not even mid mm-hmm. below mid and it would be like top tier news on sky. Uh the the way that the investment has shifted the game where Jerry Cardinale who runs Milan, a billionaire doesn't even make waves where Friedkin running Roma doesn't even make waves. Um, the, you know, it's, there's a reason why people need to start paying attention to clubs like Tormenta, mm-hmm. like Des Moines Menace, uh, like Red Wolves, you know, San Diego loyal, because that has been the sustainable model that has been, been proven to work since the very beginning and MLS has their own way of doing things with the closed system. I don't know how that's going to work uh, everywhere else, but I can promise you there are a lot of leagues looking at it. Yep. Uh, so it, we have to find sustainable ways of keeping our sport alive and nation state investment is making it where there's not just a, a gap, but it's like the difference between earth and flipping Mars. So Yes. Just saying. Yeah, just saying. Uh, tomorrow, it is a normal freestyle Friday, 9 o'clock. We get the sprint, uh, 9.30. Our friends from Beyond Goals come and visit. I think it is a Michael Parkhurst week, unless they trade off and Greg Garza is coming on. And then at 10 o'clock, it is the weekend whip around patent pending trademark coming uh, sooner rather, hopefully, than later. And then remember, uh, we have our gathering at the Reverb Hotel at the Hard Rock. And uh, that is on uh, Friday night. Uh, looks like we're going from seven to nine. And it is a very, very busy weekend across uh, everything because you've got all the action going on in USLW League. Thanks to Julie Carlson for Greenville Liberty. Thanks to Jim Robbins from South Georgia Torment on the W side. Uh, they've got their action either tomorrow night or this weekend in Austell on Sunday. Sunday, uh, SDH Network will have... Uh, Atlanta United 2 and Crown Legacy, 5 o'clock on Mother's Day. So uh, if you have not done your shopping for Mother's Day, please do so now so you can beat the deadline or you're going to be going to Walmart, getting a card, and your mom's going to know it. Guys, Mm -hmm. guys, husbands Mm -hmm. especially, Mm -hmm. if you're the, the lovely significant other in your life says, I don't want anything. I don't need anything. (laughs) It it is a damn lie. And if you believe that, I am also the owner of a very, very large soccer team. I'm a multi-billionaire and I just need some help moving a little money around. Mm -hmm. So if you could just send me your bank account information and I will move uh, uh, $5,000 to your bank account. And Mm -hmm. uh, for the nominal fee of uh, like, like, you know, I'll, I'll give you like 500 of it, right? Mm-hmm. I'll get the money back and then I'll leave you 500 additional dollars to whatever was originally in your bank account. Just, just yes. get some of your bank information. Yes. Do you believe that? Exactly. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, and Alex continues the, uh, the setup for the, the, the war to settle the score. Nick has the Marine training and the Sicilian power. Alex just has the Pearl of the Antilles ruined by commies power. So that's what, uh, that's, that's what you're staring at. With I the, love Alex, man. With the brawl for Alex. all. The brawl for all. That's what you're staring at. Alex has the power of positivity, man. He has the power of positivity. He's like the kindest soul in the world. It's like, Except when you talk Newcastle to him. 
Except when you talk Newcastle, yes. He's very he's a passionate, passionate supporter of Newcastle. And he was he was a passionate supporter of Newcastle before the money. Correct. So before anybody jumps he in, he was stuck with Mike F and Ashley. Yeah. He was when when you had Mike Ashley wearing a jersey three sizes too small. Oh, you want uh look, that that is a level of resilience that I don't need to tangle with. No. Nope. Uh, so tomorrow's the normal show. It is a sprint, which sets up the the activity at uh, the heart at the reverb on Friday night. Looking forward to seeing everybody there. Uh, check and see if there are any spots available. Uh, mm-hmm. The Flood Project on Facebook. It is an Eventbrite registry, but check the Flood Project on Facebook to see if there's any spots available. Uh, we're going to have fun because there's going to be a lot of us there. It's going to be uh, me, it's going to be Nick, it's going to be Jared, going to be Jason, going to be Mike, going to be Jess, uh, because uh, s- uh, Saturday night it's Atlanta and Charlotte. So, literally, it is this is your weekend reverb Friday, Saturday night, Atlanta and Charlotte, Sunday, it's the twos and crown legacy at the fraction and on the SDH network. So, th- that sounds like a massive weekend. Everything Atlanta United, uh, follow along with uh. Uh, everybody who's up at practice as to what's going on. I think they're doing the Q&A right now. Uh, Nick, since we are in added extra time, please, if you would be nice enough to send us home, it'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, so until next time, everybody, thanks for letting us hang out and uh, tuning in and all that fun stuff. Support your local clubs, ladies and gentlemen. Please do that because they support you. All right? Make sure that happens. Until next time, everybody, mucha mucha euro, y'all. Play it safe. It's the end of the show. That means we get to do this. See you tomorrow morning, 9.05.